in this message from God's Word, we're going to examine two verses that are very familiar to most who have known Christ for any length of time and have read the Bible. You'll remember from this morning's message in 2 Corinthians, we began to examine the things that motivated the Apostle Paul and Timothy, those things which truly moved them and every Christian to serve God. In that message, dealing with 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11, 12, and 13, we came to see that Paul and Timothy were powerfully moved to serve the Savior by their healthy and spiritual fear of the Lord, knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Paul related that motive to the Corinthians so that it would serve as a pattern for them to follow. It has served as a pattern for all believers to follow from that day to this. Paul and Timothy, you see, had no trouble with the concept of worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ on one hand and having a horror of disappointing him or disobeying him and thus being subject to his chastening, on the other hand, any challenges to contemporary Christians understanding how someone can love and fear an individual simultaneously makes for not only a poor Christian, but also someone who is ill-suited to be a mother or a father. It is sad indeed when a Christian hasn't the wisdom or understanding of the Christian faith or the knowledge of the one he claims to be his Lord to both love and fear him. Perhaps this problem in Christendom has become more prevalent because so much wisdom has been lost to feminism, to the breakup of the traditional family unit, to the imbalance that's caused in a family unit when there is one parent and not the other parent. And so one parent begins to assume functions that rightly should fall to the other parent. Uh, through no fault of that person's own, it still is an imbalance and it creates confusion that will carry for decades. And because so many moms and dads are profoundly ignorant of parenting skills that they do not recognize and therefore do not properly train their children so they will grow up both loving mommy and daddy and fearing mommy and daddy's displeasure. It is a well-adjusted child that loves mommy and fears mommy's displeasure, that loves daddy and fears daddy's displeasure. Paul and Timothy, they had no problem with such a nuanced attitude toward their Lord because their motivation was balanced. It is so likely that they learned to honor and to fear and to love their parents in the homes they were raised in. As believers, <coughs> they were then without conflict or contradiction, they were then, because, it's because of the way they were raised, they were able to grasp the notion of both fearing God and loving God because they had grown up in homes where there was a balanced relationship with parents to love the parent and fear the displeasure of both mother and of father. Were they motivated by the terror of the Lord? Oh my, yes. We saw words to that effect this morning. But that wasn't their only motivation, was it? They were also motivated by the love of Christ. They wanted their readers to come to the same understanding of spiritually balanced motives, the spiritually balanced motives that they possessed 
Therefore, while it is certainly possible for any Christian to discover the balanced terror of the Lord and the love of Christ from their studies of God's Word, how much easier are those balanced motives understood, appreciated, and embraced when a person is raised by parents, plural, who instill both love and fear in their parents, or excuse me, in their children as they raise them. I think a normal, well-adjusted little boy loves his daddy and is scared of crossing him. Loves his mommy and is terrified to cross her. Oh my goodness, I had both of those growing up. I had no problem loving either one of my parents, and neither did I have any problem uh, knowing the terror that would fall upon me if I crossed them. And um, why should parents faithfully attend church services? Why should they? Well, there are, there are um, because we live in an era in which we see uh, so many parents who have no grasp of this nuanced relationship um, that they should both appreciate and cultivate in the lives of their children so that they can raise solid and well-adjusted adults. But with those same parents, typically also, sadly, I was talking to a of it before the service, she said, Pastor, these young women, they, they, they don't listen. They don't listen. You, you can't, most of them, you can't teach them anything. They know everything. I'm paraphrasing, but I think I've got the general gist of the idea. Uh, I think Violet's a genius because she, she agrees completely with me. Um, and those parents who do not appreciate and do not cultivate both the love and the fear that ought to be recognized by their children. Um, they don't raise solid and well-adjusted adults. Um, and and uh, you, try to, you try to influence them, you try to provide scriptural instruction, and you try to set an, a wonderful example by the successful uh, Christian parents in, in, in churches that they would do well to attend, but they don't do well and attend. They don't do well and listen. They approach child rearing as a very simplistic uh, activity because for the last 50 or 60 years, feminism has basically destroyed our culture's concept of motherhood and where women believe that in order for them to be fulfilled, they've got to do everything except raise children. Excuse me, I am of the opinion that the single most complicated activity a human being can ever be involved in is the complex personality formation of a zero to five year old kid. And then, as children grow and mature, especially if it's a boy, more and more, as the mother less and less involves herself with the boy as he grows up, and the father involves himself more and more as the child grows up, then the father takes on uh, additional responsibilities of personality formation in the, both, the, both, the, both the son and the daughter. So... Um, these are things that people will enter into marriage without having been handed them by their parents or their grandparents. And so they set about the task of reinventing the wheel. They don't need to. It's unnecessary. There is a boatload of cultural wisdom, inherent institutional wisdom that could be and should be passed down from grandmother to mother to daughter. But feminism has interfered. It has resulted in breaks up, breakups of family units. It's resulted in children unwilling to learn anything from their mothers. It's resulted in mothers not knowing anything to teach their daughters. 
and um, we find ourselves as a church of Jesus Christ faced with um, a monumentally complex task of ministering to young women, some who are mothers, some who are not yet mothers, uh, some who are married, some who are not yet married, and they don't know diddly. They just don't know. You can engage them in conversation. And after two or three minutes, oh, dear Lord, she doesn't have a clue. She is playing checkers in the chess game of life, especially when it comes to her dealings with her husband. I was talking to, I was interacting with a woman who does not attend our church. She's got a husband who is completely out of control. But she knows everything. She knows everything. There is nothing she needs to learn. There is no advice that she needs to seek. There is no advice that she can take. And I'm telling you, every single blunder I have observed possible for a woman to make, she is making them day after day after day after day. I am astonished they're still married. And I think the only reason they are still married is because she's a complete sucker. And it's too bad. And it's too bad. Because I believe he's reachable. Um, I, I believe if she were teachable, uh, Lord only knows what God could do in their lives if they would listen. So, why should parents particularly faithfully attend church services? Well, let me just give you four reasons off the top of my head. First, they have been directed to do so. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. You go to church because you're told to, okay, by God in his word. A second, when you go to church, parents, when they go to church, they place themselves and their children under the means of grace. By going to church, you place yourself under the means, the most effective means of grace available to the child of God. There is no more effective means of grace. There is no better situation for a human being to receive grace from God for living, for loving, for serving, for conversion than in the combined worship of God's people. Third, they learn to be better moms and dads by exposure to other parents and also to grandparents in church. It's amazing how much is caught rather than taught. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things that a person picks up. They just, they just catch it from somebody else. It's not a formal lesson. It's not, it's not formal instruction. You just see somebody dealing with a child in a way that you've never dealt with a child, and you realize, my goodness, that guy knows what he's doing. My goodness, she has a clue about what she's doing. What competence. Maybe we ought to do that. Hey, you think? You think? I cannot imagine trying to go get through a marriage. I can't imagine trying to get through a life. I can't imagine raising a child except in church. Why would anybody want to even try to live their life outside of church? I don't know. Uh, I, I, I tried, and then I came to Christ, and then for the next year and a half, I was a single guy in a church, and I was, I was reflecting on that. Man, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. And then I got married, and I was married inside the church, and I thought, I don't want to be anywhere else. And then my wife and I became parents, and then I reflected on child rearing in a church. I don't want to be anyplace else. Excuse me. I think if a person wants to raise children outside of the church, they're nuts. They're certifiable. There's something wrong with them. If they, if they want to try to, to hold a marriage together with all of the pressures and all the forces in our culture and our society that are geared toward nothing other than ripping parent couples apart, they try to rip couples apart in the neighborhood. They try to rip couples apart at work. Families 
You know how many times in the last 10 years I've had in-laws call me up and plead with me to try to bring different people that they mentioned to divorce. You would think that your family members would want you to stay together, but they don't. If they don't like the person that you married, they will work behind your back and they will call up the preacher and try to bribe the preacher to persuade you to split that couple up. Wow. Well, at this church, I don't try to split couples up. I found that they're capable of doing that without my help. And finally, why should parents faithfully attend church services? They situate their children. And this is something almost nobody ever, ever thinks about. And by the way, you can pretty well mark it down. If you never thought about it before, your notions about it are almost certainly wrong. If it's something you never thought of before, you're almost certainly wrong about it. Okay? When people, when, when parents go to church regularly and routinely, they situate their children where their youngsters will actually learn how to behave by emulating the other children at church. Whether it be in nursery, in Sunday school class, in the auditorium. You think that kids don't pay attention to kids? You think kids don't learn from kids? You think some kid that's acting stupid because he doesn't know how else to act because his mother never taught him how to act right doesn't, you don't think that he knows how to pay attention and see how the other kids are behaving and over time he'll begin to modify his behavior so that he fits in with the peer group that he's associated with? The reason he came to act the way he did is because he's fitting in with the peer group he associates with at school and they're all crazy. And he thinks he can do that someplace else? By the way, I, I, don't, I think very few people give, give a consideration to the benefit that is not generally appreciated of families having more than one child. I, 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 find it, I find it appalling that Western civilization, people, they don't reproduce. Italy, um, the UK, Germany, France, Japan, those, are, those, those countries are in a death spiral. Because the couples there, they don't want to have kids. Okay? Uh, there's a couple of reasons why they don't want to have kids, but um, I, I think one of the reasons they don't want to have kids is because they're no good at it. They're no good at parenting them. They're no good, they're, they don't know what they're doing. And the reason is uh, because they didn't learn anything from their parents, from their mother, from their grandmother, from their aunts, from their uncle. Um, I have known a number of women who have had a lot of kids. I know a woman in our church who's got seven. Okay? Praise God for her. Um, I have known two women in churches that I was a member of that uh, had 13 kids. And uh, one, of the, one of the women, I approached her and I asked her, I said, you got a lot of kids? She smiled at me and said, yes. And I said, uh, when did it start getting easier? She said, it began going downhill with number three. I said, seriously? She said, yeah, each kid after that was easier and easier and easier as far as the mothering aspect of rearing children was concerned. And I said, how so? She said, well, by the time I had the third one, the oldest one was old enough to help me with the newborn. And she said, I just want you to know I haven't cleaned house in 15 years. And I looked around, and it didn't look like she hadn't. It looked like she had. But it wasn't her that did it. It was her kids that did it. She said, you know, I, I haven't cleaned house in 15 years. I haven't done the laundry in 15 years. She said, I go grocery shopping, and I cook because I love it. But I don't do anything at this house that I don't want to do. And I said, why is that? She said, because being a mother is too important to waste my time being a maid. My children do that. 
They run the vacuum cleaner. They do the laundry. They do the dishes. And I remember when I was a little boy, man, I had a job from the time I was five years old. Anytime somebody came over to the house without me being told, my job was to head to the kitchen and make a pot of coffee. And you remember those, those glass Pyrex uh, coffee pots? And I remember I was told by my mom and dad, you look through that coffee until you can't see the clock anymore on the stove. And when you can't see the clock anymore, that coffee is ready. They liked it strong. And my job was to bring it in on a TV tray with cups and saucers and sugar and cream and the coffee. My, what a good boy am I. My taught us how to, how to cook meals. Uh, I, could, I, could, I could cook up a breakfast, bacon, eggs, uh, hash browns, toast, by the time I was five years old. Um, I, uh, my brother and I, my mom taught us how to alter our own clothes. You know, back in the day, you buy 501 jeans that are way too big for you, right? And you fold them, right? And you, you, and you, you, you sew them so that everything stays in place, especially somebody as itchy and, and touchy as I am. And, uh, and, and we, we would lengthen our, our, the legs on our, on our Levi's and, and do the waist. We did all that kind of stuff. Why? Because being a mother is too important to waste your time being a maid. That's what children are supposed to do. And when parents know what they're doing, they have their children doing that menial stuff. And here's what children oftentimes do. Um, boy, am I going to make this sermon run long. And this is really not the topic of my message. Um, is, is children will... Will, be, will, will do a job so poorly in the hopes that their mother will give up on having them do it. Okay, they do it so, well, just, just stand and let you do that. No, 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 no. What you should do is, you don't do that right, boy, I'm going to wear you out. I'm going to wear you out. You're, you're going you're to twist and shout like you never imagined you were going to twist and shout until you do that job the right way. Okay. And, uh, and so, anyway, this is for parents that know what they're doing, and so many just flat don't know what they're doing. Um, it's, um, it's important. So let's get back to motivation to serve God, especially the motivation to, uh, um, to serve God because of your love for God and your love for Christ. The, 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 the terror of the Lord, that was this morning, okay? This is the love of Christ. Ask yourself if you're motivated by the love of Christ to serve the true and living God. A am I motivated by my love for Christ to serve Him? Now, you may think you're motivated. You may give yourself a pat on the back and say, Oh, yes, I love Jesus. That's, uh, I I'm motivated. But there's an important consideration before you can properly conclude that you're motivated. What must be present in your life before you can rightly conclude that you are motivated by your love for Christ to serve Him. What must there be to so conclude? You actually have to serve Him. Because if you don't serve Him, you cannot say, I am motivated by my love for Christ to serve Him. Because you don't serve Him. Amen? Amen? So unless you do serve the true and living God, apart from your feelings about the matter, you cannot rightly draw the conclusion that you are motivated by the love of Christ. Through the course of, of this message this evening, my prayer will be that you will discover for yourself whether you are or whether you are not motivated by a love for Christ to serve Him. Remembering that the terror of the Lord produced a certain kind of behavior in the life of a Christian, let us also know that the love of Christ produces in that same believer's life a certain kind of behavior. So if you would, please turn in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Once you're there, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. The Apostle Paul wrote, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. 
Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, all things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. Lord bless you, thank you, you, are, you can be seated. I'm sure that you recognize both the 14th and the 17th verses as being quite familiar to many Christians. What I trust God will enable us to accomplish at this time is a right understanding how both of these verses, as well as the verses they bracket in our text, should affect and influence the Christian's life, your life, as they affected Paul and Timothy's lives. The theme of the passage is obviously the love of Christ, but what does the love of Christ do? What does the love of Christ accomplish? What is the practical result of the love of Christ? There are two things the love of Christ accomplished in the lives of Paul, Timothy, and the other Christians in Paul's ministry team. First, the love of Christ affects the Christian's behavior. You say, well, I love Jesus. But if it doesn't affect your behavior, no, you don't. If it doesn't affect your behavior, no, you don't. Paul begins, verse 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us. Us, of course, referring to Paul's ministry team and hopefully the readers of this letter recognize that the word constraineth means to hold together, to bind to the, together. Let us ponder this notion of being held together in ministry by the incredible love of Christ referred to here. It's quite obvious that Paul does not specifically detail in what ways they were constrained by the love of Christ or kept from unraveling by the love of Christ, but we can agree on what Paul is referring to. First, let us agree about what Paul is not referring to. Remembering what Paul and Timothy endured for the cause of Christ, it should not be at all difficult to appreciate what the lost person would do, what the person who did not experience the effects um, of the love of Christ would do if he went through what those two servants of God went through. Would it be stretching things to maintain that Paul and his colleagues were probably preserved from nervous breakdowns by the love of Christ? Uh, preserved from discouragements that led them to giving up and dropping out, preserved from frustrations that would lead a lost person or an unspiritual saved person to maybe what? While spending sprees, periods of childish irresponsibility, episodes of testimony-destroying behavior. That's kind of a 20th and 21st century phenomenon, isn't it? I think we can all agree that the love of Christ on the negative side of the ledger, while never sparing Paul and his men any of the pains, heartaches, and disappointments we have all experienced, and, and more besides for them, obviously, did keep Paul and company from completely unraveling, like so many do who are not constrained by the love of Christ. Positively, let us agree what Paul is referring to. The love of Christ not only kept Paul and Timothy and the others from doing things that were bad or wrong or harmful, but they were also constrained to continue doing and being those things which were positive and beneficial and productive. But for the love of Christ, Paul and the others would not have continued serving God and bringing souls to Christ when he despaired even of life. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. But for the love of Christ, he and Silas would have simply sat in their jail cell and moaned in Philippi instead of faithfully representing Christ and bringing the Philippian jailer to Christ, Acts chapter 16, verses 30 through 34. In short, many, in many ways so obvious to his readers that he feels no need to illustrate or cite examples, Paul and company were constrained, were literally held together and kept from unraveling by the love of Christ. 
In other words, they didn't feel like under pressure they needed to freak out. Ah! They didn't do that. They didn't do that. They were constrained by the love of Christ. Obviously, the love of Christ had a powerful impact on their behavior. Does the love of Christ have a powerful impact on your behavior? I trust that the love of Christ is shown to dynamically influence your conduct. Does the love of Christ affect your conduct with respect to evangelism? Does the love of Christ affect your conduct with respect to witnessing, to giving to missions, praying? Those are questions that you ought to consider. As you reflect on these matters, keep in mind that Paul does not refer to himself in isolation in this regard. He is not a loner here, but reveals this dynamic of the love of Christ to be at work in his life along with others' lives. This is a group thing. The love of Christ works so much more with groups than isolated individuals than most Christians realize because of our cultural commitment to individuality in the United States. We're so much the Lone Ranger kind of thing that we sometimes rob ourselves of the benefit and the blessing of, of the corporate life of the congregation. It doesn't interfere with life. It helps life. Then we see that the love of Christ affects the Christian's beliefs. I urge you to pay very careful attention to the fact that Paul refers to his and Timothy's beliefs and not their observations. The reason for this is because what we're about to see came not to Paul by observation, but by revelation. He was able to judge the things he writes, not as a result of normal thought processes, but as God communicated truth to him by revelation. Notice how God's truth determined what Paul and Timothy believed about Christians. In the last half of verse 14, we see Paul's belief concerning the believer's past. If you're a Christian, this is your past. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Have you ever given thought to what Paul writes here? He told the Corinthians that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, because that is exactly where one died for all, on the cross, everyone died with him. I say this because although the final word is the word dead, which is a noun in English, the Greek word is the aorist verb for having died. Thus, literally, it is that if one died for all, then all died. That is Paul's declaration. That is Paul's conclusion about him, Tim, me, and you if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. So how is this to be understood? Paul informs each Christian reader that your personal history as a sinful person in the sight of God ended the moment Jesus Christ offered himself a ransom for your sin. Your history ended. So far as God is concerned then, the person you were before you were conceived, a sinner in your mother's womb, died when Jesus Christ died for you on Calvary's cross. Mm, mm, mm. Now, does that seem hard to believe? Read some other passages penned by Paul with me to see if they agree with what we understand is meant here. Turn to Gal uh, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. This was Brother Shook's favorite verse, his life verse. That's the reason I spent some time on that when conducting his memorial service a week ago yesterday. Galatians 2.20, and it's the favorite verse of so many believers. Paul writes, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, it's not the Christian's life. It's Christ's life in the Christian. Now turn to Romans chapter 6 and look at verse 6. 
beginning with verse 6, Paul writes, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead, he that is dead, talking about Christians, he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He identified with us, we identify with him. He died, we died. He lived. And now look at Romans chapter 7, beginning with verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is freed from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Here is what Paul believed about his past, and about the personal past history of every Christian, something that more than one of you here this evening need to realize. I mean, you need to really, you need to really think on this. You don't have a past as far as God is concerned. From the moment you trusted Christ, you started from scratch. That is your past. Unsay people, they carry the burden, they carry the guilt, they carry the baggage, they carry the trunk. So the baggage from your past that you lug around and use as justification to feel sorry for yourself is completely unnecessary if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Therefore, as the song says, let it go. I am not going to sing that song. But it's not just the believer's past that Paul had from God's revelation of truth to him. It's the believer's present as well. He continues in our text that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. The plan is outlined in verse 15, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Here is the plan. When Jesus Christ died, Christian, you also died to sin. Of course, this only applies to those who've trusted Christ as their Savior. doesn't apply to lost people, but for believers, the retroactive benefit is that when Jesus Christ died, you died to sin. But it doesn't end there. You were given the gift of eternal life when you were saved, and the reason you were given life in Christ at the time of your death to sin was so that you could live your new life not for yourself, as you did in the past, but for Christ. It reads that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. That's the plan for your present life, Christian. And it's a plan that was actually lived out by the grace of God in the life of Paul and in the life of Timothy and the life of every wonderful Christian you've ever known. The practice is shown in verse 16, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. The term flesh is used by Paul to refer to all that is natural in a person. It's your natural desires and longings as well as your individual personality and whatever emotional makeup you have. 
Um, it includes the sum total of everything you are as the result of the information that you've gathered through your five senses. It is you, unaffected and uninfluenced by God or the things of God. Notice what Paul declares with reference to the flesh in light of this. He no longer looks at others through the eyes of the flesh. He makes no evaluation of others based on their social standing, based on their income, based on their education, based on their race, based on their appearance, based on their figure, based on their abs, based on their love handles, based on their knobby knees, based on their warts, based on their crooked toes, or their culture. The only thing about other people that Paul thought had any importance at all was a person's spiritual condition. Is he saved or is he lost? Does he act saved or does she act lost? And what about Christ? Same thing. He no longer evaluated Christ with respect to the things of the flesh. Was Christ a great author? No. Was he highly educated? No. Was he a successful entrepreneur? No. Was he highly thought of by his own people and in his own country? No. Evaluating Christ through the eyes of flesh will result in every lost person staying lost. However, when you look at Christ through the eyes of faith, when you examine him in light of things that are truly important, eternal values, you will see that he is the altogether lovely son of the living God, the Savior of mankind. In the present, then, God's plan is for you to live for Christ, not for yourself. And if you put that plan into practice, you'll stop evaluating people according to different standards that you will begin, uh, different standards, and you will begin to, to ask this one question, the only significant question. Is he saved or is he lost? Does she act saved? Or does she act lost? The principle underlying both the plan and the practice mentioned in verses 15 and 16 is found in verse 17. Wherefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. This verse is a classic first-class conditional sentence. I've reviewed that with you before, not do so again. Paul is strongly affirming some profound truth, truths, that are true if the first phrase or the condition is true. Are you in Christ? By the way, that's all that matters. That's all that matters. You are in Christ if you've trusted Christ as your personal Savior to the saving of your sinful soul. Does the phrase any man apply to you? Yes, it does. If you've trusted Christ, you can be dead to sin because of your past, according to verse 14. And you can live for Christ instead of for yourself, according to the plan of verse 15. And you can relate to everything and everyone differently, according to the practice of verse 16. Why? Because of three interconnected truths. First, because you are in Christ, you are a new creature. God did not renovate you when he saved you. He regenerated you when he saved you. Neither did he reform you. He started from scratch and made a new you. You have the same old body and the same behavior and personality patterns because of the things that are stored in that part of the body called a brain, no matter how big or small yours may happen to be, but in God's own time, you're going to go to heaven and you'll get a new one of those as well. That said, understand this, when you trusted Christ, your wife got a new husband. When you trusted Christ, your husband got a new wife. 
And when you came to know the Savior, your children got a new mommy or a new dad. Not a perfect mom or a perfect dad, but a new one. Second, because you're in Christ, the old things are passed away. Think you need a smoke? <laughs> Think you need a drink? Think you need a roll in the hay? Think you need a line? Think you need to do or think of any of the things you did or thought before you were saved? Don't believe your five senses. Don't believe your cravings and appetites. Don't listen to your body when it screams, I need to commit sin like the old days, because that's a lie. If you have to choose between believing what your body screams at you and what God tells you about your so-called need to commit sin, believe God. Let God be true and every man a liar. Third, because you're in Christ, all things are become new. Not all things can become new. All things are become new not all things will become new it reads all things are become new all things have become new for the Christian because by the grace of God you now live in a different universe you are now in Christ how many of you folks remember me telling you that what you believe determines how you behave Verses 14 through 17 teach that very thing. The first part of verse 14 is where Paul told us how he and Timothy behaved. They were held together by the love of Christ. Then in the second part of verse 14 through 17, Paul told us what they believed. He and Timothy believed that when you are saved, you become dead to sin. When you're saved, God's plan is for you to live for Christ and not live for yourself any longer. When you're saved, your whole way of looking at your fellow man and at Christ changes. They believed that all of this is because when you are saved, you really do become a brand new creation of God. Assuming you know Christ, if you believe the things found in verses 14 through 17, if you, if you really believe these things, then you also know how much Christ uses us, more collectively uses us than some might want to admit. Some people are absolutely committed to being the Lone Ranger. They want to live out the Christian life in isolation from other people. That is not God's will for your life. Even if you go through life single, God's plan is for you to live out the Christian life in community, corporately. Mm. So that we are a channel through which he expresses his love to others to offer them such a wonderful salvation as we enjoy, complete with its fresh start at living. Because Paul and Timothy realized how much Christ loves through us, those as yet unsaved to minister to them such a salvation, they returned Christ's love. They lived out what Paul or what the Apostle John wrote in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, and 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. We love him because he first loved us. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Because Christ first loved them and showed it by so marvelously saving them, Paul and Timothy showed their love for Christ in return by living the life described in our text. In essence, Paul and Timothy so believed that Jesus Christ loved them that they loved Jesus Christ in return and showed it by the life they lived for Christ. What a powerful motivational force love, real love, can be in a believer's life. As it was in Paul and Timothy's lives, so it should be in our lives as well. However, love all itself, listen carefully, listen carefully, mamas and daddies with regard to your little chillin. Listen carefully to the believer's relationship with the Savior. Love all by itself is not 
sufficient to motivate Christians to live a consistent life. Remember talking to a man years ago, I said, I said, Fred, you need to wear that boy out. He's gone wrong. He said, no, Pastor, he'll never go wrong. He loves me. I said, Fred, there's lots, there's lots of children that go bad who love their moms and dads. Love doesn't keep a boy or a girl from going bad. Well, what does? I said, fear. They need to love you, and they need to fear you. They need to love you when it's time to love you, and they need to be scared of you when it's time to think about doing bad. Oh, no, I just don't think so, Pastor. Well, the last 30 years have proven not me right, but God writes. Witness the proponents of love and only love in Christian circles. You see this b borne out? To live a consistent Christian life, your motives, just as the motives of your children, need to be balanced. Are your motives to serve the Savior balanced? We saw this morning that the terror of the Lord produced obedience in the lives of Paul and Timothy, and the terror of the Lord produces obedience in everyone's life for a while. But the terror of the Lord as a motive all by itself can only motivate for so long. In the end, it produces Christians who talk about the fear of God, but who don't really serve God. They, 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 uh, they are provoked to wrath, aren't they? And they begin to grumble and gripe and complain. They become embittered. How about love as a motivating factor in believers' lives? Have you, have you taken stock of the various shades of Christianity found in Southern California which espouse a love and only love relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? How effective is love all by itself as a motive to serve God? Doesn't appear to be very powerful for very long, does it? The crowd that preaches love and only love for God in Christ is the same crowd that refuses to separate from sin and un ungodliness. It's the same crowd that shows no concern for doctrinal purity. It's the, it's the same crowd that thinks it's perfectly acceptable to run with liberals and modernists so long as they say praise God and hallelujah every so often. If you take the truth of my previous message on the terror of the Lord by itself, you have unbalanced motives to serve God. But if you take this message all by itself, you still have unbalanced motives to serve God, to serve Christ as He deserves to be served, to worship Him in spirit and in truth, to properly honor and glorify Him with a consistent Christian life. There must be a proper balance I should say a proper and balanced understanding that approaches both the terror of the Lord, or I should say appreciates both the terror of the Lord and the love of Christ. Without that balance, you'll tend either to be a legalist who always raves about fearing God, but who is not spiritual and whose life does not glorify God, or, or you'll be a libertine who always raves about the love of God, but who's not spiritual and whose life does not glorify God. Let us appreciate not only those attributes of God's character that we like and feel comfortable with, but those aspects of his nature which our flesh balks at. If we take that balanced and scriptural approach, we'll be a great deal more like Paul and Timothy, and in so doing, will be a great deal more like Christ, won't we? And what were Paul and Timothy like, precisely? Were they not fervent witnesses for Christ? Were they not church-planting missionaries? Did they not live life to fulfill the great commission of our Lord Jesus Christ, establishing and urging others to help them establish churches? That's called missions, my friend. Whether it is witnessing, inviting, participating in evangelism here at home, or praying for and giving to missions, the motives are two. The fear of the Lord and the love of Christ. 
Are you a non-participant in outreach? Are you an evangelism no-show? Do you not give to and pray for missionaries? Then you are not properly motivated. Notice that I'm not telling you a, a tearful story to produce an emotional response. I'm not talking about some little poor crippled girl so that you'll go boo-hoo and cry. Or some, or some boy in a third world country who's starving, got big, a big stomach and a fly on his nose. I'm not doing that. That's manipulation. I'm not exerting manipulative coercion in an attempt to persuade you to do what you do not want to do. I'm setting before you the truth of God's word regarding the fear of the Lord and the love of Christ as scriptural components of proper and balanced motives to serve God as a spiritual Christian. If you live right and do God's blessed will, you show your fear of the Lord and the love of Christ that constrains you. However, if you are a non-giving, no-show, you display to men and angels that you do not fear the Lord. On one hand, neither do you love Christ on the other hand. Case closed. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. We pray that you might help us to be thinking men and women, responsible for our beliefs, responsible for our actions and reactions. Help us to live for you, love you, and serve you effectively, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name.